Fantastic. A'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala al-ashraf al-anbiya'i wal-mursaleen. Sayyidina, nabiyyina, wa qurrata aynina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wa ahlu luqadatan min lisani yafqahu qawli. A massive salamu alaykum to everybody joining and everybody watching a recording. Uh, I hope you are all keeping well and enjoying uh, sort of uh, life as COVID and lockdown and everything is slowly easing and uh, the, the summer is approaching. Hopefully uh, things are a lot more joyous, inshallah. Today's session, very, very excited because we are now get it, getting into the sort of topics, uh, you know, hardcore business topics, the sort of thing that I am very excited to be sharing with our Muslim, uh, sort of Muslim community of entrepreneurs. And it's all based on this really, really amazing book, which is called Blue Ocean Strategy. Some of you may have heard of this. And it's how to create uncontested market, market space and make your competition irrelevant. And I think this is something every entrepreneur needs to read. And hopefully after today's session, you won't need to read it because inshallah in today's session, we'll be able to share with you the, the key concepts and the key takeaways that we as entrepreneurs need to be aware of uh, in terms of this very unique. And the authors, they are management and strategy professors from a, one of the world leading uh, in universities, in, in, in one of the best universities in Europe. And they spent, they researched over 150 companies and they've noticed that the companies that don't go into existing established markets to try and compete with incumbents the companies that don't do that and the companies that decide to do something different to bring innovation, they are the ones that not only stick around for a lot longer, but they have much, uh, much higher profits and growth. So the key idea of the blue ocean strategy, and by the way, doesn't matter what business you're working on, what I'm going to be sharing today, inshallah, is very much applicable to any business, inshallah. And in fact, we can even apply the concepts from today's session to come up with new business ideas. So uh, I'm really excited to share this and I'm gonna get, get straight into it now, inshallah. So the whole concept of um, this theory is that entering an established market is a bad idea, okay? Uh, and, and by the way, you know, it, this is not to, um, if you are entering an established market, it doesn't mean <laughs> that you need to change your course, but try to uh, uh, sort of absorb the concepts and the theory and some of the principles we're going to be sharing today. So the key idea of Blue Ocean Strategy is that instead of trying to beat your competition, just avoid it. You don't need to compete with anyone just completely make them irrelevant. And like I said, this will lead to more profits, being more profitable in the long run, and also more longevity. The business will stick around for much, much longer. And the idea is that you should create a new product category that you can then go on to dominate. Uh, now, what are some of these ideas? Let's engage you guys a little bit. Can you think of a business that you have come across which doesn't have any competition? They're so unique that at least in the first year or two, they didn't have any competition. Of course, people then copy, uh, copy your, uh, try to copy your model and things like that. Okay, fantastic, Snapchat. Very, very true. And now, uh, you know, WhatsApp is doing the stories. You've got Instagram trying to do the story. So they're trying to copy Snapchat, but initially, fantastic, Uber is another great example. When they first launched, there was nothing like it in the market. There was no competition whatsoever. Of course, now more players have come into it. We've got things like Ola very recently. You've got things like Bolt. 
you got things like Captain, you got things like Via Van, and they're all literally copying Uber. When, when Uber first launched, there, there, there was no such thing as competition for them. Fantastic Netflix is another great example. For the first good period of Netflix life, there was no one else, there was nothing else that, you know, there was no one that they could look at and think competition. Uh, and even LinkedIn now launch stories, right? So people do catch on. However, first mover advantage, you're the first person, you're the first company doing something different, you will definitely benefit from that, okay? So the idea is, let's, le and by the way, uh, Netflix, Uber, and Snapchat, Yes, they came up with a new, complete new product. What I'm sharing today in terms of Blue Ocean strategy is you can go, you don't necessarily have to come up with the next Facebook and the next Uber and the next Netflix. You just have to look at an industry and completely uh, revolutionize your value proposition. And we call this value innovation. This is the key takeaway. So the key thing is, how can I give more value for a lot less cost? Netflix is an amazing example of that. The value, so when you subscribe to Netflix, you have a plethora of content and it costs next to nothing. So that's an amazing example of value innovation. How can I give more than anyone else for less than anyone else. They completely changed the game. And now so many, there's more, many players coming into it. You know, you've got Prime, you've got these other weird names that I see. It's on my, uh, on my smart TV. I don't even use them because obviously Netflix is obviously leading the way. They have the best content. They have the best uh, interface. They're always innovating, coming up with new, uh, new content. Um, they, they've got really, they, when the experience on the actual Netflix platform is really, really good as well. So this is the key. How can I add more value than the competition or in the industry? In the industry, how can I add more value at a low cost? So maximizing the utility, the value, the benefit that the customer gets and making it accessible and affordable to the masses. Okay. So another great example, I guess, probably is also Amazon Prime. Because what you get with Amazon Prime is a phenomenal service, next day delivery. And it's only like, I think, yeah, it's so small that I don't even remember the figure. It just goes up my account. I don't even, I don't even feel it, right? So how many people have Netflix, Amazon Prime, and Uber? How many people right now on this live call have all three? And this will give you an idea of the market penetration. These brands have gone into the homes of millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions, possibly even billions of people. So inshallah, give us a thumbs up or a number one if you, have all, if you are a user of all three, Uber, Netflix, and Amazon Prime. It's a lot of people, inshallah. Fantastic. Uh, wow. So that, that's quite, 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 <laughs> mashallah, pretty much most people in, in, in this live call right now. So that gives you an idea of the, the level of success that these brands are enjoying at the moment. Now, this is great. Value innovation, give as much as you can for as little as possible. That doesn't mean, so, uh, and by the way, this is counterintuitive because usually, a low price product means less value or less quality, right? Because in every industry you have premium, premium brands, 
that charge more and they give you a, a higher quality. Then you've got the mid range and you've got the budget stuff, right? This is completely, you know, getting rid of that paradigm. And it's saying highest possible value at a price that the masses can afford. Absolutely groundbreaking. So let me quickly, um, I want to be able to see, excellent, fantastic. Brilliant, I wanna be able to see the chat. There we go. Excellent, so what I loved about the book is that it's extremely practical. They try to give principles, they try to give frameworks, they try to give graphs, they try to give formulas. So it's very, very practical. And I would, and I would encourage you to inshallah, go ahead and read it. But the idea of the business school is that, you know, we do all of the hard work of getting all of the cutting, you know, cutting edge leading uh, business knowledge, business uh, education and share it with you in bite-sized, practical, digestible format, inshallah. So what you want to do is look at any product or any industry that you're in, okay? And start doing, if you want to innovate the value, let's start doing these four things. So this is what the authors call the four action frameworks. You've got to do four actions. Number one, eliminate. Number two, reduce. Number three, raise. Number four, create. What do, I, what do I mean by this? Number one, eliminate. So what factors can I or can we eliminate from a particular product or a service in a current industry? What are the factors that are perhaps disadvantages? So for example, in the home video entertainment space, uh, you know, if you wanted, let's, let's, let's imagine a world pre-Netflix, okay? Most of us are old enough to remember Blockbuster, to remember what else we used to. Obviously, a lot of people stream things illegally and all that sort of stuff. But what used to happen before Netflix? If you wanted to watch uh, a new movie every single evening, you'd have to either rent it or you'd have to be flicking channels and hope that something is on. You'd have to uh, download, search, and illegally maybe, maybe download uh, certain videos. So what Netflix is, is they eliminated, yeah, they eliminated the need to waste time either searching or going to get time and the cost, of course, because there's a cost of going to Blockbuster, renting something for a couple of nights, paying for that, then going back again, there's a time and a cost element there. So they eliminate it. So, you know, is there something that we can eliminate from the current practice in the industry? Very, very important, yeah? Can we eliminate uh, complexity? Can we eliminate certain costs? So what Amazon did is they eliminated the need to pay for postage. Amazon Prime covers it. You don't need to pay for postage ever again. We eliminated that with our, pro with our service. So something you want to think about, number one is eliminate. Number two, is there something that if maybe we can't eliminate it, but can we reduce it? Can something, what, what are the factors that can be reduced in a particular industry? So for example, EasyJet, which I think has done, have done an amazing job at creating a blue ocean for themselves. Egypt, Jet and Ryanair, I'm not too sure who came onto the scene first, but they did something that other airlines have never done, which is to literally make flying and aviation, air travel, affordable for the masses. Even students, university students. My first flight that I took uh, with EasyJet that I paid for myself, I was a GCSE student. And I bought the ticket myself, paid for, for it myself. So 30 pounds, 40 pounds, 60 pounds, sometimes even seven pounds. That it was a massive innovation, value innovation. So they made flying accessible to the masses. And this is something we're going to come, come to later on as well. So they reduced the cost of entering this space and becoming a customer in this industry. They reduce the cost. Were there implications in terms of quality? Yes, there was. Inevitably, 
you know, you are not going to get a comfortable seat. You're going to get a little bit less space. You're not going to get a nice meal. You're not going to get an, uh, you know, a, a, to a toilet. You're not going to get great service. So they, but what they focused on is other things. And there's, a, there's an example in this book of South, uh, was it Southeastern or Southwest? Southwest Airlines, one of the most famous successful airlines in the US, which have a similar model to EasyJet, but they focus on certain things and they let go of other things, which people don't really care about that much. You know, if I'm on a two hour flight to Milan, I don't care too much about the quality of the food. Uh, what I care about is, can, what, can I get that for as cheaply as possible? And in fact, sometimes flying with EasyJet and Ryanair is the cheapest option, cheaper than driving there. Uh, and that was a, a absolute game changer. A lot of us don't realize that. The third thing we can think about, uh, and again, you know, these, these are principles that can be a, a, a applied to any product, service, industry, sector. Is there something that can be raised? What can be raised? What are the factors in this industry, in this sector that can be raised? Okay. And obviously the examples uh, many and one of them obviously is quality that we can think about uh, uh, what, what, what are some well let's let's get let's involve you guys a little bit inshallah what are uh, let's say we're in the sector of coffee yeah we we, we want to open a, a chain of cafes yeah coffee what can be raised as a factor in the space of selling coffee uh, and i don't mean the beans i mean the actual beverage so if you wanted to open a rival to costa and starbucks you know what would we raise what would be improve very obviously very simple that we can improve the taste of coffee and arguably uh, you know, when you go to Costa and Starbucks, the taste of coffee is not top notch. In fact, I was watching a documentary just yesterday evening. It was, uh, it was one of the short documentaries about these companies called Blue Bottle, Blue Bottle Cafe or Blue Bottle Coffee. And basically, it's a, it started off in a garage. A guy started selling um, freshly roasted and freshly ground coffee, which, were, which was roasted at a temperature at, at a time, which produced the optimum taste. And they are abs they're going global now. They're everywhere now. Uh, and the price is more, but the, the, they managed to raise the quality of the coffee. But what you can also increase is the uh, options. We've got something here about coffee flavors. Ahmed is saying coffee flavors. Okay, very, very true. And th that's exactly what I think Starbucks was very successful in doing. They just literally created so many variations and options and they apply to, they, they try, they, there's, a, there's a flavor for anyone and everyone. There's no, you're bound to find something that you like. And what they've also done is they've in, in, included specialty and limited offer, limited time flavors which increase their curiosity and increase their engagement with the with, with your customers because you know that you have that curiosity and that interest to go and try something new the fourth and perhaps the most difficult one is what factors can we create in this space in this sector what it, it was something completely new that the industry hasn't even thought of introducing what is something completely new that we can introduce. And I guess Netflix is a great example of that. No one ever thought of, let's have, and by the way, I'm, I'm, well, uh, there is a similar model to iTunes. So arguably iTunes was the real innovator where before iTunes, people would either have to purchase the full CD, even if they only wanted to listen to one song, they had to purchase the full CD from a shop or they had to go on LimeWire. Let me know if you remember LimeWire. <laughs> I remember the days on LimeWire and burn and, you know, illegally download a particular track that you're looking for. And the issues with that was that maybe the quality, obviously it was illegal. Secondly, the quality wasn't always great. 
you need to know exactly the name of the author, the, 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 the artist, the name of the song. There was a lot of issues. And then what I, iTunes did is forget all of that. We have a store with 200,000 tracks. You just need to type in the name and there's a very easy search function and you don't need to purchase the whole album. You can purchase a song and it's the highest quality and they literally just revolutionized the way people consumed music. Uh, we have some good, uh, some interesting, and by the way, cafes, uh, there are, um, I, um, there's a few uh, people that uh, are close to me who are very interested in cafes. And uh, I think the, some of the ideas here would be very useful to them because, you know, we've got things like the atmosphere, very, very, very good. There's a really popular cafe in, in Ilford at the moment, which is actually very expensive, but they specialize in organic. So everything in that cafe, the sandwiches, the coffees, the salads, everything is organic. So they basically raise the bar in terms of the quality uh, and the ethics. Uh, and and, and they haven't created anything new per se, but they raised, they raised something. And that place is always packed. Excellent. So these are some easy takeaways for us. When we're looking at a particular business sector and industry, a particular um, business, how can we eliminate something that's not ideal, that potentially is a disadvantage, is potentially something that may be putting customers off? How can we reduce something? How can we, what are the factors that we can reduce? What are the factors that we can enhance and raise? What are the factors that we can create that don't exist? Now, for me, obviously, when I'm, when I'm reading these books, I'm comparing them to my main baby, my main business, which is the Golden Touch Academy. Yeah, I do have other businesses, but this is my life and soul. So I'm always thinking, what, you know, how does this apply to our business? So in terms of eliminating, uh, and by the way, I do believe Golden Touch Academy is a blue ocean because there's no one right now in that space of helping Muslims with financial independence. Yes, there are uh, companies that have set up to help you with investing, such as Yielders and uh, Igloo Crowd and all these other companies that you can invest with, but they're not doing the education. They're not doing the sharing of multiple opportunities, investment opportunities, and they're not doing, obviously, their actual support and coaching. On the other hand, we have, there's, there's quite a few different uh, people in this space who offer, you know, high ticket programs that, you know, I will teach you how to start an e-commerce business, I will teach you how to do this, or a um, digital agency, or an online business, and, you know, you, you got to sign up to an expensive program with them. So what we've done is completely revolutionary, I believe, which is, you know, we raised uh, what people can get in terms of the access, what you're getting, we've raised that quality. Because when, when you join, let's say, a property course or, or a, a online program, and we're part of those programs, you only get taught specifically about that program. No one's going to teach you about Islamic business principles. They're not going to be t t talking about uh, blue ocean strategy. They're not going to talk about uh, productivity routines for the morning. They're not going to talk about um, how to choose the right business for you, how to uncover your passions and all these different things. So we, as I believe we have raised the bar. We have created something completely unique in the sense that there's not one place where you can go and get the support, the education, the coaching, uh, and the opportunities and the community for something for a ridiculously low price. Let's just say, and most of you are not paying this at the moment, let's just say it was only 50 pounds a month. Uh, you know, some of the programs that more, some of you are already aware of this, you're looking at 1500 to 2000 pounds just to access that program. We've done these programs, we've done them ourselves. I'm currently doing a, a online marketing advanced level program. Uh, and that's, that was $2,000 for three months. And it's a coaching package with lots of resources and stuff. So I believe that we have completely innovated the value. But enough about Golden Touch and us. There's a lot more I want to get through, inshallah. So there are three things. So inshallah, make a note of these things, yeah? So this is the key 
four actions that you can take to innovate value, okay? So bring something new to the table. And uh, examples obviously are very, very useful. But the next thing I want to touch upon is what are the three things that we need to innovate? And they are basically, this is a good way to demonstrate that. Okay, two triangles. So the first triangle is how can we lower cost as much as possible? And this triangle is how do we increase value as much as possible? Okay, cost and value. And when we're talking about cost, uh, obviously this is the utility, the benefit to the customer. And this includes cost, obviously means the cost of the business yourself, but also the, the price that you're able to offer to your customers. So this covers both of cost and price. So once you're able to do those, the overlap is where you have value innovation. Yeah, so that's where you have value innovation. Alhamdulillah. Excellent. I'm just going to quickly take a look at a few fantastic the comments coming in. We've got a few private comments. That's absolutely fine. Jazakallah khair. So, so far, very simple. Let's create, let's create a, new, a completely new space for us instead of going into something that is already full of other competitors and by the way why do you think it's called blue ocean because uh, the opposite of that is a red ocean why do you think they picked that name because it's actually very interesting And if you're struggling, blue ocean's never ending yet, kind of. Basically, in a blue ocean, there's no blood. In a red ocean, when there's loads of competitors and other fish, you're all trying to eat each other. You're all trying to get one on each other. So it's, it's a bloody ocean. There's a lot of competition. There's a lot of other people who want to beat you, who want to get ahead of you, who are trying to get your customers, who are trying to get your market share. It's a bloody business. So forget that. Let's, let's pick a blue ocean where there's no blood, there's no other fish. You are the only big fish in this wonderful blue pond. And that's basically the idea is that forget going into something that already has a lot of competition. Come up with something innovative. And obviously this session is all about, okay, how is this innovative? What are the principles of coming up with something innovative. So Alhamdulillah, they, they go through six principles of blue ocean strategy. So there's six principles, but the key idea is value innovation, okay? So this is the main thing I want, you, want, want, to, want everyone to take away. How can we deliver more value and make it affordable for the masses? But this, it gets even more interesting uh, than that, yeah, right? It gets even more interesting. Uh, and by the way, what they recommend is that you do like a diagram, okay? When you're analyzing any sector, when you're analyzing any business that you want to improve, you know, uh, you do, do, do a diagram like this. So you've got eliminate, here you've got raise, here you've got reduce, and here you've got create, okay? And then you should put the bullet, bullet points down. And this potentially can lead to you coming up with a fantastic new idea, which is completely blue ocean. So you can look at any industry and any sector. So even whatever sector you're thinking of, whether you're creating an app or you have a podcast or you're trying to create a service, um, you are providing a service or you're trying to come up with a product, this is very helpful. So they say that, you know, make sure that you go through the actual, this actual process with, with this diagram. Excellent. So everyone with me so far, inshallah, yeah? So let's 
before I move on, let me share a, an example. So the example was of Southwest, Southwest Airlines. Now, who has heard of them? And what are they known for? Let me know, inshallah. What are they known for? Southwest Airlines. What are they known for? Uh, yes, except for the controversial parts. So, Southwest Airlines are known for two things. Firstly, extremely friendly service. Okay. Extremely friendly service and the fact that they're very cheap. So, it's almost like the Ryanair and EasyJet. Here in Europe, we have Ryanair and EasyJet. But they actually ha have an emphasis on being extremely friendly, extremely friendly. So they want, it doesn't matter you paid only $30 for your flight, you're still going to be respected and treated like uh, royalty, okay? So, uh, da -da 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 -da, their stuff play jokes, I've seen some viral videos, yes. So the stuff is very, very friendly, okay? Friendly, friendly is the word that keeps coming up. Because there's a difference between good service and friendly service, okay? So they're cheap, but they're also known for flexibility. So they have a lot of flexible options, flying options. So essentially what they've done is really, really clever. By increasing the, the, the quality of service, the perceived quality of service, and reducing the cost, They've done a couple of things here. Uh, firstly, they're undercutting all of their competition, number one. But what's more interesting is they're tapping into a completely new group of customers, a completely new sector. So America, as you know, is a very big place. Anyone from America on the call right now, let us know where you're from. It's a very big place. So if you're trying to go from one city to the other, it may be an eight hour drive. And an eight hour drive, you're looking at maybe two or three full tanks of fuel, pet petrol, diesel, and you're looking at a lot of time. So what they've done is they've made flying a viable option for people that before couldn't afford flying and would have had to opt for driving the whole way. Now it makes no sense for you to drive because you can fly for cheaper. So what they've done now is they're now accessing a whole new ocean of people that were not flying before. Very, very interesting. So their tagline is at the speed of a plane at the price of a car. So whatever, you know, imagine you're trying to go from a particular city to another city and that's a seven hour drive. Um, it may have cost you $200 in terms of fuel there and back but you can get a Southwest Airlines flight for maybe $120. Game changer, right? And that's exactly what happened uh, in Europe with Ryanair and EasyJet. And I remember the couple of times I had to travel to Scotland. And when I did the calculations, train was super expensive. I don't know why trains is so, <laughs> so expensive, right? I have no idea why train is so expensive. And then I calculated the cost of driving there and back fuel, time, and all these other things. And then I could have flown there for 40 pounds. So it made sense just to fly there, okay? So that's what's really, really interesting. And they have carved a, a, a very unique space for themselves. And obviously, the one, one of the biggest success stories in terms of business in America. Um, uh, so this was just an example of a principle which is the first principle, which is reconstructing market barriers. So 
there are six principles. I'm going to cover four today because the second two are more advanced and they talk more about execution uh, and actually managing the business structure, how to manage your people and all that sort of stuff. But I think the ones that are most relevant for us at this stage, and inshallah, I can uh, you know, go through the other ones, but at this stage, I'm going to share four of them. The first one is to reconstruct reconstruct market barriers what what does this mean this basically means exactly what southwest airlines did when you're an airline you have a particular group of customers but what they were able to do is to tap into a new group of customers so they completely reconstructed their market boundaries so if this is how many people are able to afford a flight, a $300 flight to go from New York to California, and this is how many people are, can't afford it be, uh, and are driving instead, by making your service cheaper, you're now tapping into this wider, bigger circle, bigger circle. So they reconstructed the market boundary. Okay, they literally expanded it massively. Same thing with, for example, again, we keep going back to Netflix, but it's such a great example. You know, not everyone is able to spend, I don't know how much Blockbuster was, but I rem uh, let, let's assume it was like five pounds or five euros for a, a renting a particular video cassette or a CD for a three nights. You know, not everyone is in a position to be able to spend that if they wanted to consume, let's say, five movies a week or five movies a month. It does add up. But when you suddenly say $7.99 unlimited movies, that is a complete game changer. And that now opens up a huge market, huge, huge market. So the principle this is the first principle so within this they gave a few different options so the first option is to look across industries so is there any other industry whose customers you can tap into yeah something potentially not in your current industry that you can tap into? Is there any, any potential industry like that? And the example that they give, and one way to look at this is, you know, what are your customers' alternatives? So let's say, for example, let's say, for example, I want to learn a new language. Yeah, I want to learn a new language. Can you tell me what my options are as a customer? What, what are my options in front of me? If I wanted to learn a new language, let's just say, Arabic or a European language like Spanish, what are my options? Fantastic. So we've got some apps. Uh, I can go abroad and these are all come in, you know, alternatives that I have in front of me. I can get in, there's a, several apps. I can maybe get a tutor. I can maybe travel to that country sign up to a course at a university or an institute there's all these different there's all these different alternatives that i have as a customer now you as someone who wants to teach spanish you need to remember that me as a customer i have all of these options so now you should think to yourself how do i tap into each and every single one of those how can i give something that appeals to someone who is in a different category okay so and the example that's given in the book let me quickly check time inshallah because uh, i am in a state of flow i don't know if you guys can tell i had such an amazing time go going through this book uh, and making notes that alhamdulillah i'm uh, absolutely looking forward to continuing this inshallah let me know if, by the way this is going well so far if you know your 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 the pace is good and you're keeping up 
and you're finding this valuable, inshallah, let me know by just pressing a number one. Uh, or if it's going terribly, just give me a 10. Uh, and then I'll, um, I'll kick you out of the chat. <laughs> Keep going, alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khair, Ustaz Usman. MashaAllah, barakallah khair. Thank you so much. Because usually we, we get to see your faces, so I can, get the, I can tell whether you're bored, whether the energy is low, whether you're you know, playing on your phone. But at the moment, all I'm seeing is names on a screen, right? So it really helps to, to give the feedback. Thank you so much, a lot of great feedback. So the example given is the example of a company called NetJets. And they've done something really, really interesting. So when it comes down to executives flying, so imagine you're a CEO, yeah? You're a CEO, you've got offices scattered all over Europe, all over America, and you sometimes have to have a meeting in the morning in London, and then in the evening you may have to be in Berlin, next morning you may have to be in New York. What are your options here? So one option, obviously as an executive, you're not gonna go on an economy type of flight. It has to be relatively good and nice. So your options, depending on how much money you have to spend, what would be the options? Let me know. In, in the book, they're saying the options are either obviously commercial airline, either go with the first class or a business class flight. Uh, suhail has got a bang on. It's commercial versus private. So you either go on a first class or a um, business class flight or you try uh, you you know buy yourself a private jet and uh, and then go that way now what are the pros and cons the pros of business class compared to jet is obviously it's a lot cheaper you don't need to spend six million dollars on a jet uh, but the, the cons are queues uh, you know security you may not get the time that you want to to be able to land there with enough time so we've had this problem uh, in the past when i was working uh with ustad nabila lazami we would be you know we would be invited to places like malaysia to deliver a training program and the program starts at 9 a.m so we need to get there at a, maybe the night before but sometimes the flight is landing at 2 2 a.m or the flight is landing too early so the fl there's no flexibility there's a lot of time wastage so those are the pros and obviously with private jet it's like a taxi, you go, you jump on, there's no checking, there's no queuing, you, you decide when you leave, you decide when you land. Now, what they've done is said, okay, how can we provide the convenience of pri having a private jet at the price of business and first class? Now, if they do that, what's happening, they are tapping into both markets. If they can give the quality of a jet for the price of a business, they have gone across industries. They are tapping into the whole market, the whole executive market. So what did they do? Essentially what they did is that you can basically almost like rent a private jet. So they, I think you can rent it, you pay like $300,000 uh, and you get a share and you get a, a X amount of fly, uh, flight hours and that sort of thing. So they've made it affordable to have the flexibility of a job. Of course, you know, um, you're not, as a company, you would rather spend $300,000 than 6 million plus salaries of pilots and all that sort of stuff. And you're not gonna be using the private jet every single day, right? So it makes sense to let's have this expensive asset and let's share it out between different people. Uh, fantastic, right? Fantastic. So that's what they've done. They came, they, they given the, the, the pros of the private flying and the comfort of the private flying, the convenience of private jet at the price of business class. Because look, if a um, executive does 15 flights in a year or in a month, you look, you're already, let's say in a month, there's five flights and the business class, you're looking at five grand, seven grand is not cheap. It adds up. So now they can tap into the whole market. And they are worth billion. They're multi-billion. I think um, Warren Buffett bought shares in them in the 90, in, in early 2000s. So they're doing extremely well. So that's how they were able to uh, cross barriers between industries. So that's something that you can think of. How can we cross barriers into that another industry? And how, how what are the different industries? They have to be industries. With, so for example, you know, an app, 
is a different industry than a local language center, right? They're very in different industries. They're, they're achieving the same goal, they're providing a similar objective, but they're very different industries. Now, how can you provide a service that attracts everyone across those different industries? That's number one. The other thing that they talk about is across strategic groups. Very interesting. So this is going a little bit more micro, okay? So we spoke, we spoke about different industries, but now we're speaking about same industry, different groups. And the example that they give, and it's important to give an example to really understand this properly, is a company called, in America called Curve. Uh, it's a health and fitness company. So they basically wanted to help women exercise more frequently. Now, at that time, as a woman in America, you only had two options, really. You, you either joined a health center, a fitness center, like a proper gym, where, you know, there's loads of machines, there's loads of people, there's men, there's saunas, and they're quite expensive. You're looking at maybe 50, 80, 90, 100 dollars a month. Or you just try to work out at home. Those were the two main options, right? Those were the two main options. What they've done is how they looked at the pros and cons of each. Now the, pro, the cons, the pros of being at home is that it doesn't cost a lot, but it's difficult to motivate yourself. It's difficult to continue to have consistency. You may not have the equipment. You may not know what you're doing. So how can we solve these problems? And how can we solve the problems on this side, which is expensive is we've got more machines that I need. I don't want to bump, be bumping into men. Uh, for example, I don't want to uh, be paying uh, for sauna when I don't need it. I don't want, I, there's, there were a few other things that they mentioned, right? So what they did is create something in the middle that appeals to both groups, which is basically uh, a small center. It's not a massive gym with loads of machines. It's a small center, one type of machine. All of the machines are set in a circle. So people are facing each other, can have a conversation, can work out together. One machine, very affordable, $30 a month membership, uh, and women only. So they were now able to attract both groups and created themselves, reconstructed the market barriers, completely tapped into two different uh, strategic groups and provided. And they, uh, apparently there's a new curve I think it was this one. There's a new curve franchise, excuse me, opening every four hours. They're so popular. And the other, the other benefit was from a business perspective, uh, opening a curve franchise only requires about thirty to forty thousand dollars because you just need a small, small, relatively small retail space. Whereas, have opening a massive gym, equipment, rent, space, saunas, swimming pools is very, very expensive, right? So he also attracted franchisees, which is another, uh, another factor for them absolutely exploding their business. Very, very interesting. Just having a quick look at some of the questions that have come in. And I may uh, take some of these questions at the end, just for the sake of uh, time, inshallah. I may take some of these uh, towards the end. Let me quickly check how we're doing for time. Fantastic. Wow. 10 minutes. Inshallah. Hey, time is really flying. We're pretty much, uh, we're not too fast. So the other, the other one, the other example was of uh, look across buyers. Chain of buyers. So what was interesting, and I never thought about it in this way, when it comes to buyers, there's three different types actually. You've got users, you've got purchasers, and you've got influencers. So a user is somebody who buys it to use it themselves. A purchaser is someone who buys it and they may not use it themselves. So I may buy a product for my son, a toy or a, or a book, but I'm not gonna be the user someone else is going to be. And then you've got influencers. For example, my doctor is the one that will tell me which medicine to buy. 
he's the one that decides I then buy. So you have to think about this different, the, each different uh, customer and they obviously have to be tackled in a slightly different way. Now, the example that was given is of a pharmaceutical company uh, in Norway. And what they did, they created a blue ocean within the space of uh, uh, producing insulin. So usually insulin is something that has to be prescribed by your doctor, then they usually, you know, uh, administer the insulin, the syringes involved, there's all these other things involved. And a lot of these examples, you know, are from a, a few decades ago, right? What they did is, instead of focusing on the influencers, so most pharmaceutical companies would focus on the doctors. So they would market to the doctors that, you know, our insulin is more pure, our insulin is easier to administer, blah, blah, blah. What they did is, forget the doctors, why don't we go directly to the user? Forget the influencer, let's go directly to the user. Who are the users? People who have diabetes or people who need insulin. So what they did is they created uh, something innovative, which was Novopen. So the very first self-administering, um, what do they call it, pen? User-friendly. It's a user-friendly self-administering pen. So now, you don't need to go to your doctor to administer yourself some insulin. You can do it yourself. And what they were able to do is they, instead of competing with all of the other pharmaceutical companies who were focusing on the doctors, uh, which are the influencers, they focused on a completely different buyer. They, they actually focused on the end user, which meant uh, that they now were not in competition with the rest of the pharmaceutical companies anymore until, of course, they started doing the same thing. But by that time, they had first mover advantage. They had a stronghold. The brand name was out there, uh, word of mouth, uh, brand recognition. Everything was already in place. So they, they, they will always, they will most likely be the leading brand for many, 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 many years. So this is how you can think about your market differently. So how can we increase our target market? How can we tap into other industries, other specific groups or other types of buyers? Very, very, very interesting. The next principle, okay, so that would be number two, is focus on the big picture. Very, very interesting. So instead of normally when people want to enter or want to start a business, they will look at how big is that market? Who are the competitors? What is their prices? What is the spread of, you know, of, uh, you know, internationally? What is the scope of business? Um, how many new uh, how many newcomers are there what are the entries uh, the barriers to entries all this very complicated stuff so here they're saying don't focus on the numbers focus on the big picture which basically means analyze your industry you know analyze your competitors find out what you can eliminate what you can re uh, raise reduce create uh, explore the boundaries so you know the first principle what are the different boundaries um, and, you know, look at your competitive competitor strategies and look at the big picture competitors, the industry, the strategy, look at how you can innovate the value. Then you will be able to come into that space and have a strong business concept. So it's a very different approach. Don't go into, uh, you know, don't look at the numbers of that industry, look at how you can innovate, look at the bigger picture and how you can completely, uh, you know, revolutionize the way things are done in that particular space. Okay, so there's a big term, yeah, when we, in entrepreneurship, uh, you know, disrupting, yeah, disruptive entrepreneurship. People want to come in an industry and disrupt it. This is basically it. How do you disrupt? a industry which is operating in a particular way for many 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 years right a great example that was given 
um, is Pret au Manger. Uh, most people in London will know about Pret. And what was interesting is they've been around for a while. And before they came into the market, as a city worker, if you wanted to buy lunch, your options were very limited. You, 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 there may have been a few takeaways, but uh, or you'd have to go to a supermarket to buy some really not tasty sandwiches, or you have to go to a restaurant and sit down and do all of that time wastage, expensive. So what they did was really, really interesting, which is very, very fresh, high quality, faster than fast food. Because when you go to pray, everything is there already. They don't need to pack anything. They don't need to fry anything. Everything is there and it's ready. Very nice vibe, reasonable pricing, quality, very fast service. So they, they were, they created their, you know, Blue Ocean, their own Blue Ocean, where, you know, you can't compare a Sainsbury's uh, meal deal with food at Pratt. Because even if you go to Sainsbury's, you've got to queue up, you've got to walk all the aisles, you've got to see what's there, the quality is not going to be any good. Oh, well, as good. You may not find the crisp that you want, there may be a queue uh, on, the, on the way out. It doesn't compare. So on, different, on many different levels, they innovated on quality of speed, uh, delivery, and a few others. And we're going to go through some of these, inshallah. So focus on the big picture. So who, uh, many of us thinking of, about our business uh, concepts or business ideas, let's focus on the big picture and see how we can innovate the value. The third principle taught in the book, uh, reach beyond. Very, very interesting concept. Reach beyond existing demands. So don't fight for the same pool of customers with 10 other companies, you know. Tap into different pools. Tap into new pools. Tap into multiple pools of customers, okay? So it's almost similar to reconstructing market boundaries, but this is, uh, sort of the, uh, the uh, he, they structured it very very nicely because they say that there's three what, what you need to do is think about okay uh, let's say this is my customer base and if I was a let, let's say I think they had the example of prep and the example of prep uh, you know let's say these are the number of people who work in the city at the moment and uh, yeah, who work in the city at the moment and who like to go out for lunch. But here's the number of people who, if we gave them a better, faster, cheaper option, they would also come and eat out. They will stop spending time at home making sandwiches and they will just come and actually leave their offices, come and buy a sandwich, buy a lunch, buy a soup, buy whatever. So these are the people that would, would, would have been happy to go and spend money in a restaurant and spend a bit of extra time in a restaurant during the lunch break. But this is the, the, all of the people that don't want to do that, can't afford to do that, not willing to do that. But the moment you can offer something to them, they, be, they will become your customers. So these are customers and these are non-customers. Very, very interesting. Very, very interesting. And there are three types of non-customers. Yeah, there are three types. The first type, they call it soon to be, meaning that they are just waiting for a better solution. They are just waiting for a better alternative. If somebody offers it, they'll jump on it. Okay, so um, say for example, if I'm working in city of London and at the moment I'm bringing food from home because there's no halal options. But the moment a halal place opens in the vicinity of my office, I'm going to become a customer. So these are the soon to be customers that you can tap into and they're just waiting, they're just waiting for. <laughs> 
a, a better solution or a better option, okay? The second type, and by the way, as we go through this, you know, think about, you know, are there any soon to be customers waiting in my business, for my business right now? Is there anyone that I can tap into if only I can figure out how to solve their problem? The, the second type of non-customer, they are refusing. Maybe because it's not good enough, maybe because it's too expensive. So for example, I'm refusing to go and spend 15 pounds at a restaurant during my lunch break. That's just not gonna happen, I'm sorry. But if you can give me a better option, so if you can make it cheaper, I might consider it and, and, and move up that way. So they are basically refusing at the moment. Uh, as in strongly refusing. The next level, and I'm just going to speed up a little bit, inshallah, is unexplored. Meaning, your industry hasn't even thought of these people yet. Your industry has, hasn't even regarded them as customers. The industry has ignored them. For And the example of, let's say, for example, this could be students university students because most uh, and maybe the industry sort of you know all the restaurants they are pricing them out or they're not catering for them but the moment uh, you know you think of how can i appeal to this completely new uh, pool of non-customers you are not tapping into unexplored type of non-customers okay so Every business has this level of non-customers. So customers who are not customers yet, but they have the potential to be. And we just have to. And the Blue Ocean is, is basically about tapping into all of these. Yeah? Fantastic. Three. The fourth, and I'm going to finish on this, inshallah, is about the, having the right strategic sequence. Yeah, the fourth. And like I said, the six, but I'm only gonna cover four because the other two are a little bit too advanced uh, for us right now. What, the, what does this mean? This means that you have to, in order to have a blue ocean strategy model, you have to do things in the right way. In order to have a robust business model, there's a, there's a sequence that you have to go through. And this is the sequence. The first thing you have to ask yourself is, buyer utility. So we have to ask ourselves, are we providing exceptional value? And there's different, uh, you know, pillars of this, you know, how it, can we make the purchase easier, more pleasant? Can we make the delivery faster, easier, more pleasant? How can we make the use of the product or the service uh, more, uh, easier, faster or more pleasant? Can we, are there any supplements necessary right now that we can get rid of? So do, do, does the customer need to buy something else in order to be able to use our uh, our product or our service is it easy or hard to maintain the product and how easy or hard is it to dispose of the product so these are things that you can ask yourself but what we are what we're looking for is exceptional value if the answer is no gotta rethink you can't move on basically at the end of the sequence is where you have a blue ocean idea but if this is no, if you don't have exceptional value, you gotta stop, rethink. If the answer is yes, then we're looking at price. But you have to start with the value, right? Price. Is this accessible for the masses? Is this significantly cheaper than the current industry? If the answer is no, go back and rethink. If the answer is yes, we can move on to the next level, which is cost. And that is, do we have a very sweet mar profit margin? 
So is the cost low enough? And is there enough profit for us to thrive? If the answer is no, gonna stop there and rethink and figure things out. If the answer is yes, we can go to the last thing, which is adoption. And by the way, if any of you need to leave, I know I'm slightly over. If anyone need to leave, of course, the, the session's recorded and live streamed on Facebook. You can catch up later, inshallah. I'm gonna finish up very, very soon. So again, adoption is the final step that you gotta think about. How is it, is it for a customer or a new customer to adopt my product or my service? Are there any hurdles? If yes, have I come up with solutions to these hurdles, right? So essentially how can we make it as easy as possible for a new customer to adopt my product or a service? But it has to start from here. That's number one. If you have that in place, then you move here. If you have that in place, then you move here. And then only after that. And this, the result is your blue ocean. Idea. Blue ocean idea at the end of it. So these are the four main principles. Just to recap them. The main principle was to reconstruct your market boundaries. Can you tap into, can you go across industries, across groups, across time, across geographies? Uh, number one, number two was focus on the big picture. Number three, reach beyond your existing demand. Can you tap into other pools around you? And number four is get the strategic sequence right. So make sure that there's a strategic progression happening. The other two, just for those of you who are curious, is uh, overcoming key organizational hurdles. Again, this is a little bit advanced. We don't really need to be thinking about that at this stage. And uh, number six is to build execution into strategy. So to build in a, a bias towards execution in everything that you do, whether it's your strategy, whether it is your team building, your recruiting, your everything, there has to be a bias towards execution. So that is my high level summary, practical summary of this very, very interesting book, Blue Ocean Strategy. Inshallah, you can look forward to more uh you know sessions like this this is you know this is the point of the web classes is to teach you inshallah something uh from the best in the world and there's no shortage of amazing business content and education it's very overwhelming uh when you start so i think what would be great is on a week by week slowly let's work through them slowly and let's slowly build up your own business acumen our own business acumen because uh, obviously when I'm reading this and I'm, I'm learning about these things myself, of course, I read this book before uh, and most of the books I will be sharing in this year are books that I, I have read before and I think are completely game changers. Um, and the idea is that obviously not only we have the coaching and the support and the Islamic side of things, but we also need to have the world class business education. And business is more than just, you know, how do you set up a website and a few Facebook ads. Business is about strategy. Business is about understanding your, uh, you know, strategic sequence. Business is about understanding different types of markets, different types of users, different types of customers. So hopefully that was useful. I'm going to stop talking and do let me know if you have any uh, feedback. If you have any uh, suggestions, any questions, inshallah, let me know. And I look forward to seeing you all on Thursday, inshallah. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik ashadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayh.